Hi, my name is Michael Andrew, and I'm about to give you your free tutorial on Canon's brand new Rebel T8i. If you are coming from another camera system or you're already experienced, you're probably going to want to check out the table of contents. You can access it in the description and also search it by pressing Command F or Control F, depending on your browser, typing in the topic that you're interested in, and it should highlight next to the time code if we have a chapter marker for it. This will allow you to click on the time code and jump to that part of the lesson. It is really designed to be a video reference manual if you're only looking to find out about one or two topics. If you are brand new to photography or if this is your first camera, I have to give you a word of warning. This video is not going to be enough to give you the skill sets to take consistently great images. This video deals with the operation of the camera. And I say that because there's lots of other things we need to know. Things like the basics of photography, shutter speed, aperture, depth of field. We have to learn about the artistic side, composition. There's a lighting aspect. Now we have these different scenarios that we're shooting in. Now we, we're starting to use flash. And there's also these video features and how do the settings change depending on real world shooting situations. So there's a ton of information beyond the operation of the camera. And I say this because we are in production on the Canon Rebel T8i crash course that will teach you all of those things. It's the fastest, easiest way to learn your camera. If you're interested in it, I will put the link in the description. If we're still in production, leave your name and your email address on my blog and we will reach out to you as soon as it's ready. Be sure to check out my Canon T8i Facebook users group, a positive, fun, safe place to share your images, questions, ideas, troubleshooting tips and resources. I'll be checking this group regularly, so it's probably the best place to interact with me directly. That link is also in the description. In any event, we have a tremendous amount of information to cover, so let's get started. The first thing I wanna do is talk about putting lenses onto our lens mount. You'll notice that when you get your camera, it'll have this little notch right here. That notch is important in regards to a reference point to putting it back on that I'll show in a second. So anytime you take the lens cap off of the camera or a lens, you're going to push the lens release. It's right here and you're going to rotate it. And you're going to notice that this dot lines up with the red dot on the mount. You will also notice there is a white dot and there is an important difference between these two. The white dot is the indicator for the lens mount for EFS lenses only. What does that mean? An EFS lens is a lens that was designed specifically for a crop sensor body. Canon also makes full frame sensors, which is the equivalent of a 35 millimeter frame of film, and those are referred to as EF lenses. So when you're purchasing lenses, read the fine print if it's an EF or if it's an EFS lens. When you get an EFS lens, you will see the white dot on the lens barrel itself, and it's basically giving you the indicator point of what to line up. So white dot onto white dot, and I'm gonna line those up, and I'm going to rotate it until it clicks. The beautiful thing about this is that all EFS and all EF lenses will mount to our Canon T8i. Important to note that you cannot put an EFS lens onto a full frame DSLR body because the lens itself, the, the flange mount is a little bit deeper. And what happens is the mirror hits it when you're shooting pictures. So you, so you physically can't put this onto a full frame DSLR Canon camera. However, in some cases you can adapt it over to mirrorless cameras when you get this extra space and you get it away from the camera body a little bit. That's the short answer. A very important piece of advice that I can give you is that be mindful of your environment when you're changing the lenses. So if you are out on a very windy day and there's lots of dust and particles, probably not a good idea to change your lens. And the second part on this is that when you do change your lens, change it with the mount opening faced down. Even if you're in a calm room with, with no wind or gust or breeze, because we live in a microbe world, there's dust and particles everywhere and they are constantly falling, usually from top to bottom. So if you get dust on your sensor, you will see it as a little gray speck. It'll be on every single image that you take, and eventually this is going to happen, but by having proper lens changing etiquette, you can minimize this and reduce 
the number of times you have to clean your sensor. I have some videos on cleaning your sensor. It's a pretty straightforward, easy thing to do with the right tools. And at some point, if you're shooting often, you're probably going to need to have your sensor clean, so it's worth checking that video out. Another important side note is that your lens cap, almost all of them, will have the filter thread, in this case, 58 millimeters, for the lens threads itself. And this is going to be important when you are putting filters or polarizers on to your lens. You'll need to know the size of it. In just a moment, we're going to go through the buttons and the overview. But while we're here, I want to point out a few things real quick. We have a built-in flash, and it is activated by simply grabbing on the sides and lifting up. You will also notice there's a very small button here in the front, under, almost underneath the lens, near where your right ring finger would rest. This is a depth of field preview button. It's not really an important button for beginning photographers, but I just wanted to point out it's right here. You're also going to notice that on your lenses, you have some switches, one for a stabilizer. When your lens is on a tripod, typically you can turn this off and it'll reduce the vibration if you're shooting video. We also have this switch here that says AF to MF that stands for auto focus or manual focus. And I get a lot of questions from beginning photographers where they're saying, hey, my focus isn't working and they've accidentally bumped this switch. It's very easy to do as you're handling the camera. So just keep an eye on that if, if you run into that problem. So white dot to white dot, we're good to go. Also get a ton of questions about a memory card when you're first getting started. We can hold one memory card in the T8i. The memory cards that I recommend are the SanDisk Extreme Pros. And they, they have black with gold writing like this. Very important, there's a little icon here that says U3. If you have any intention of shooting 4K video, you are going to want to make sure you have, at minimum, any Class U3 card. That is a sustained write speed. And I, I get a lot of emails from first-time camera owners like, hey, my, my video's turning off. And it's because they found just a, you know, a standard memory card in their desk and they put it in their camera and it doesn't have the performance for the 4K video. These are relatively inexpensive you know, anywhere from 30 to $40, depending on how many, how much memory you have. And so what I always tell beginners is get a good memory card and the SanDisk Extreme Pros, I have more of these than any other card. So you'll notice that we get a little orientation indicator with the corner cut off kind of thing. And then we put it into the camera until it clicks and we shut the door. Real quick talking about the battery. Obviously it's in the bottom of the camera. To release the battery out of the camera body, we're going to push this gray lever towards the front of the camera, and the battery comes out. This is an LPE17. It's a smaller battery, and when I got the camera, I had to charge it. It took almost an hour to charge the battery completely. My recommendation, if you do a lot of shooting, is to at least get one more of these, possibly two, if you're going out you know, for an all-day shoot kind of thing. Uh, not the greatest capacity batteries, and I'm, I'm telling you this now so you can prepare. I do recommend Canon original manufacturer batteries. Not a huge fan of, of the generics, but some people use the generics and they're fine. And again, I'm going to orient this. There, there's a little diagram here. It's kind of confusing. There's looks like there's two batteries, but pins go to the inside of the camera. So if you can remember that, and it goes. Real quick, I wanted to talk about these flaps on the left side of the camera as we hold it. These are very important ports. On, in the front port, we have a remote terminal where we can plug in a wired remote. And on the bottom, we have our microphone input. Very important if you are recording quality video is to get an external microphone. I, I make a Maven mini mic as a beginner microphone. It's really tough, it's sturdy, has a huge frequency range. And this is where you would plug it in. Unfortunately, there's no headphone jack on the T8i, and that's okay. We've seen it in other Canon cameras, and, and we can work around that as well. On the other side, we have our USB port and our HDMI port, which is useful for doing different kinds of things. There's a utility that will now let us stream web video using the camera for much higher quality web broadcasts and things of that nature. HDMI, you're going to feed that out to your television if you want to play back images or video on your TV. There's tons of applications for these. I want to take you on a quick tour of the camera body and some of the buttons and features and how I refer to them so you know what I'm talking about in a future lesson. Obviously, we have the shutter button here. We have our primary selector here or a main dial. We're going to be using, obviously, the shutter button a ton. You're going to be using this a lot when you're changing your camera settings. Obviously, we have the power switch here. On means that we are shooting on a photographic mode. 
and the video camera icon means that we're shooting in a video mode. Very important to distinguish the difference between those two. This is the mode dial. And as a beginner, you're going to want to put it, you know, there's this temptation to put it on the green mode, this A with the green box. I call it the dummy mode. Lovingly, it's an affectionate term. And uh, some of these other modes, like the scene mode and the creative filters mode, I, I don't really use them. The two modes that we use more than anything, at least in my lessons, are aperture priority and manual. And we'll talk about those when we get into the mode lesson. But this is what I'm talking about when I say the mode dial. Got this little white tick mark right here, and that tells us which mode is selected. This is referred to as the hot shoe. It's metal, and these pins in here will help trigger a speed light or a flash. I cover it on my full crash courses. There's almost an hour lesson on how to use a flash, and this is where we connect. We also use it to connect accessories like our microphone. To the lower right of that, there's a little plus minus sign next to this button right here, and this is referred to as the diopter adjustment. This is for those of us who wear corrective eyewear and we need to change the focus of the optical viewfinder. Some of the other buttons that we see on the top of the camera, there's this little box here with these tick marks in it. I refer to this as the cluster selector button and it is going to aid us when we are choosing different clusters for focusing looking through the optical viewfinder. ISO, you will notice, has a little dimple on it. And the reason that is done is so you can know which button it is as you are looking through the viewfinder so you don't have to pull your eye away from shooting. You can feel the ISO button, press it, and change it. The ISO button changes the electrical boost added to the light. It's an electrical gain, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in the exposure lesson. Finally, we have the display button, which toggles different sets of information that I'll demonstrate in just a second. Looking at the back of the camera, obviously we have the optical viewfinder. We have the deep menu button, which will cover a huge amount of information in the deep menu. The information button toggles the types of information displayed on the back monitor. So the display button toggles the types of display and the info button toggles the type of information on those displays. The little red dot in this button right here indicate the start and stop of video recording when we are in a video mode. And it also indicates with the white camera live view when we are in a stills shooting mode. Live view basically means that we're able to preview the shot before we take the picture. Can you imagine using film and not knowing what your picture would look like until two weeks after you took the picture? This is how it was when I began photography. We'd have to take you know, pictures on film, send it off somewhere, and then it would come back two weeks later. We're very spoiled is what I'm saying. Now, some of the buttons that I talk about are customizable. AF on stands for auto focus on. This is for back button focusing. If we don't want to use the halfway shutter button depression that I'll talk about in a second, we can use the auto focus on button and engage it. And uh, this is preference. Then we have the cluster selector button. You'll notice it right here. It's a little box and it has these little tick marks in it. This is going to help us to select different focusing clusters when we are shooting through the optical viewfinder. And below that, we have a little star button, which is the exposure lock or the flash exposure lock button. It basically freezes our camera settings so they don't change in terms of the brightness of our image. The Q button opens a quick menu that I'll demonstrate in just a moment. We also have what I refer to as the directional pad. It's, there's actually a number of controls here. There is a rotating wheel that spins around. This rotating wheel I refer to as the secondary selector because it allows us to select secondary menu items. And we also have these different icons in these different directions. To the left are our drive modes. This is what the camera will do after we push the shutter button down all the way, including timers, high-speed continuous bursts, single image, things of that, that nature. Pushing up will access our white balance. Pushing to the right will determine our auto focusing modes and pushing down is our picture style. So yeah, and if you don't have your camera, grab it and follow along. I shoot this way so you can see exactly what I'm shooting and you know, basically practice as we go along. So we have a rotating wheel, we have a directional pad that we push in, we also have a set button in the middle. 
The set button is sort of like an enter or return button on a computer. It means that we agree to the information that's highlighted. Below this directional pad, we have the playback button. Obviously, it's going to play our images. We have a garbage can icon, which obviously would delete our images. And you'll also notice it says lock here. This is to engage a lock feature, which I don't recommend for beginners. If your lock mode is accidentally turned on, it can be really confusing. Also very important for me to note is that the articulating monitor, this touch screen here is extremely powerful. We can interact with our menus. Canon, in my opinion, has one of the best laid out menu systems. It has one of the easiest to use with the touch screen. It is a joy and a pleasure to use, and I'll be demonstrating some of those features as we get into the lessons. Something I want to point out about the shutter button in the front of your camera, and I'd recommend doing this, is grab your camera and gently push down on your shutter button, and you'll notice that there's like this little stop. It's like a midway point. That will engage our camera's focusing systems. I'll demonstrate this later, pushing it down all the way will take the picture. So you can feel that there's really three positions for the shutter button. The first is when we're not touching it, it's in the fully up position. There's a halfway position when we're engaging the focusing systems and all the way down will take the picture. Very handy to train our finger to feel the difference between those three positions. When we turn our camera on the first time, you're going to be asked to enter your time zone. Much of this is pretty straightforward. We have this white screen. I'm gonna dial this information real quick. Basically, we get a, an orange highlight so we can see it. And when we're ready to, to select something, we hit set, and then we can go to the month, go to the next day. Pretty straightforward. I live in Hawaii, and we do not have daylight time savings here, so we're just gonna leave this turned off. And I'm gonna select my time zone. Once that's all set up, we're gonna hit OK. And we're into the menu. There are a few things that we want to set up on our camera before we move forward. So for the sake of everyone's sanity, mine and yours included, we are going to come into this menu where I'm scrolling left and right. You can also use the touch screen is we're going to come to this display level settings and hit OK. We are going to want to turn off the feature guide. We're going to disable that. We're also going to disable the mode guide. Otherwise, we get these prompts that pop up. The shooting screen, we're going to go to standard. And the menu display, we're also going to go to standard. Why would I do this? Canon is trying to make it easier to operate the camera, you know, by having these guided menus and things of that nature. And as you get more comfortable with your camera, you're going to be tripping over them all the time. So when you turn them off, you're really getting, in my opinion, the full access to the camera. And this time, so when we hit the menu, now we're, we're looking at the real menu, but it's this aqua tab here. If you ever want to go back to it, if you want those guided sets of information as we you know, go through the different screens, this is where it is. But this is the deep menu that I know and love. Very powerful. So I'm going to tap the shutter button and come out. And you're, you're going to notice that we're on a program mode and we have this black information screen. And what I want to do is introduce you to Live View by pressing the Live View button. Very important to know how to do this. It seems pretty basic and straightforward. My power switches to the on position, which means that we're shooting in a photographic mode. And all this does is it's turning on a preview, allowing me to see the image I am about to take. Coming back out of Live View, we're back to this black menu screen. And when I push the display button, it disappears. So the display button is really allowing us to toggle on or off this back monitor. Now, the reason why I point out the display button is because often what happens is photographers will bump it and they'll wonder where their information screen went. You can, you can get there by pressing the Q button. So the Q button will open up the quick menu, but just be aware of what this display button does. It turns the back monitor on or off. If you want to save battery, you would turn it off. What I want to do first, in trying to keep this as simple as possible, I'm going, to, I'm going to put the camera into manual mode, and I want to walk through some of this information that we're seeing on the back of the camera. Three sets of information that you will see on just about every camera, usually on the bottom of the monitor or in through the optical viewfinder, 
is our shutter speed, which is typically denoted in fractions, one 125th of a second in this case. This is referring to how long the shutter will be open. F designates the aperture. It's how wide the lens will open. And we also have our ISO setting over here. I am going to turn my ISO setting to a fixed number and not auto because in the beginning, this is going to make a lot more sense when we have control over the ISO. Something else that's happening right now is that the camera is turning off as I'm teaching. So I'm going to come into the deep menu and I'm going to turn off the auto timer because it's just turning off, it's making it kind of difficult. When I'm navigating through the deep menu system, you can see the highlighted tab by pushing to the left and right. And we also have these pages in here. We'll talk about this more when we go through the deep menu, but if, if you're navigating, just know that the highlight tells you where you are in terms of the tab, the page, and the selection on that page. So right now my auto power off is after 10 seconds. When I'm teaching, I don't like that. So I'm gonna put it to eight minutes so it will not turn off. If I left it on eight minutes, it's going to drain the battery pretty quick. Let's take a look at some of the other information we're seeing in Live View. So I'm pressing my info button, and this is something that we should get used to doing. Just press the info button and toggle different sets of information. So we have a no information screen, we have a basic screen. What do these other things in here mean? This guy right here is where we're going to see our exposure compensation bar. We're gonna be talking about this quite a bit in the exposure lesson. In the top left-hand corner, we have the mode that we're shooting on. So as I change the different modes, you can see it changing. The number in between the brackets is the number of shots remaining on our memory card currently. This will change a little bit depending on whether we're shooting JPEG or RAW. And the number after it is the number of shots we can take in the current burst mode before the buffer fills up and slows out. In the crash course, we talk about sport shooting and how to set it up, and you can watch this as this happens. This is our battery indicator, and as our battery runs out, you will see some of these tick marks being filled in. We have a Q mode button on our touch screen. We'll be talking about that in just a second. So the touch shutter, essentially what it does is it allows the camera to take a picture after we touch on the monitor. And I do not recommend turning this on because every time you touch the monitor, it's going to take a picture. It is, however, very powerful for focusing. We'll be talking about that in a minute, but this is what happens when you have it on enable. Now, every time we, <laughs> every time we touch the screen, we're taking a picture. It's just, it, you can't sustain it because there's lots of other things that we do on the camera. You will also notice that as we touch on the monitor, let's turn this off, we get this little focus icon appearing. We can turn that focus icon off by pressing the focus icon off. We'll be talking about that in the focusing lesson. So this is a pretty basic screen and it, there are tons of more types of information we're gonna go into, but I wanted to go through these other information screens first. This is our full information display screen. We'll be talking about that in just a second. This is our histogram, which is going to tell us about how exposed, right now there's an even exposure. If it was to the left, it would be a darker exposure. If it was to the right, it would be a brighter exposure. We continue to press the info button and we cycle all the way around. So when we press the info button and we see all these different types of information, this is really giving us feedback in terms of our focusing mode, the burst mode, our metering modes, tons of info. But the way to really navigate through this is to press our Q button when we're in live view because then we can get these different sets of information. The way this works is that we have our features on the left and right columns. So a column here and a column here. On the bottom of the screen, we have different settings within that specific feature set. So in this case, I am highlighting my autofocus method. And on the bottom of the screen, we have these different focusing types. So that's how, it's wor how it works. And when you see that little orange box, it's telling you which feature is highlighted. And you're going to look to the bottom of the screen to change settings within that highlighted feature. 
So in the top left-hand corner, we have our auto-focusing clusters. We have our auto-focus modes. Below that, we have our drive modes, which is what the camera will do after we push the shutter button down all the way. On the bottom, and I'm just pushing to the left and right with my directional pad, so up and down is going to move you up and down. And the column left and right will move you side to side on the specific settings. So a single box means one image. You push the shutter button down once, hold it down, one image. High speed continuous burst means is that when we push and hold the shutter button down, the camera will continue to take images. On the Canon T8i, it maxes out at seven frames per second. And then we go to the low speed continuous burst, which is not as many frames per second. Then we have a 10 second timer, a two second timer, and then we have a self timer with continuous. And you'll notice it gives us this prompt to press the info button. You can also press it on the screen. And this is allowing us to tell the camera how many images to take when it gets to the bottom of the counter. So we can take up to 10 images if we wanted to use this feature. Why would you use this? Well, when we're shooting group pictures, sometimes people blink. So if you're part of the picture, you'd set the timer, you would run in to the picture, and let the camera take multiple images. And so when somebody blinks, you can Photoshop their eyes with another picture where they weren't blinking. That's probably the most useful thing for that. Going down, we have our metering modes. If we have time, we'll cover this and I'll demonstrate what's going on here. Then we have our image quality, which determines the settings for our JPEG and RAW images. Lots of numbers in here. The important thing is, is if you're just getting started, shoot in JPEG large and you're going to be fine. I don't really recommend shooting in smaller image sizes unless you're, you know, you're like posting images on eBay all the time because those images are smaller. We'll talk more about quality when we get into the deep menu. The return arrow basically kicks us out of the Q menu. And below that, we have our white balance. We'll be talking about this in a separate lesson. As we go down, we have our picture styles, which is basically how the camera is creating the JPEGs and we're basically telling it what type of information to keep and what to throw away. The short answer is in the beginning, stick with the A. Auto lighting optimizer. This can be a nice feature. It adds a contrast bump. Uh, in this case, I'm gonna have it turned off. If we come down to the creative filter and we get a number of different options on the bottom, this is gonna work obviously better outside than it would. I like to shoot on white blinds for teaching. Kind of a fun thing to take a look at, not a professional tool, so I don't really go into it that much. And then we have our aspect ratio, which I recommend leaving at three by two, which is using the full sensor dimensions. So I know that's a ton of information, but that's what they are. Now you have a reference point. If you ever forget, you can come back and we go over it again. When we come back out and we're in this screen, we can see the icons that we have selected. They're, it's just basically saying this is where you're at right now. We also have our Wi-Fi icon, which right now says off, and we have an exposure simulation indicator, which means that when we take a picture, we're getting a preview of how bright it is. And I have my drive mode set to that continuous guy. I don't want that. I'm gonna turn that back. And that is what these icons mean when we are in live view. So the question then becomes, what if we're not in live view? What if we're shooting through this optical viewfinder? You're going to see certain sets of information, including the shutter speed, the aperture, the ISO, and your exposure compensation bar. Before we jump out of live view, I wanna put the camera into video mode. So you can see that our information set has changed in the video mode. You'll notice that we have this red dot here, which is also start and stop video recording. If I push it, you can see that we're recording. I can push it to stop. I can also use this button here. We have a couple other new icons that did not display when we were in the stills view. So let's take a look at those. And you'll come down. The most useful in here are the movie recording size. This is the dimensions for video. If you're going to shoot 4K or maybe full HD, this is where we would determine our resolution. And Canon is giving us the dimensions and the frame rate. So 3,840 is 4K, it's close enough. And then 2,160 pixels tall. So that's what's selected right now. 
but just know this is where we choose our resolutions. Something that you're going to notice is that when we select our options from here, 4K is cropping in, it's punching in a little bit. Whereas when we're, we're using standard HD, I'm looking at the blind, the blinds here, is that we have our full wide angle. Coming down a little bit further, you'll notice that we don't have our digital zoom when we're selected into 4K and we have digital image stabilization. I recommend leaving this turned off. It's something that you can do in post if it's really shaky, but if you're having a problem with tons of shakiness, it's better than nothing sometimes. This is where we turn it on. We also have our white balance, picture styles, and auto lighting optimizer. Just know 4K grays out some of those options. So when we're in standard HD, we get the ability to punch in or not. There's another feature in here referred to as Servo AF. It's an automatic focusing mode. We'll talk about that in the focusing lesson. So just keep that aware is that we have different feature sets depending on whether we're shooting in live view or photographic stills. So you'll notice that when I was in video mode and it came back to the photographic mode, it kicked me into what I call the black information screen. You can access changing this information by pressing the Q button. There's a touch sensitive Q button here. You can also press it here. And uh, a lot of the information in here is the same. I just flipped it over to manual mode. Pressing the Q button, we get the orange highlight and we can change that setting using our primary control wheel. We can also use it by touching on the icon, touching and dragging. This is, in terms of user interface, this is super nice. We can change our f-stop in the same way, or we can use our primary selector. We can use our secondary selector. We can use directional pad. Many different options to change the actual setting. So let's go through each of these information sets so you know what they are. Just briefly, we've, we've covered all of them. They're pretty much the same. We have our shutter speed, aperture, ISO. We have our Wi-Fi connectivity. We have our flash exposure compensation. We have our exposure compensation, which we'll be talking about in just a moment. We have our picture style sets, white balance, white balance shift and bracketing. We have our auto light optimizer. We have our custom controls, which I'll point out in just a second. We have our auto focusing modes. We have our focusing clusters, which allows us to choose different types of focusing groups. Talk about that a little bit later. We have our metering modes, which determines how the camera measures light coming into the camera. We have our drive modes, which we've already covered. Here they are. It's what the camera does after we push a shutter button down all the way. And then we have our quality. This determines whether it's JPEG or RAW. And if we're shooting JPEG, we can determine more compressed files or even smaller file sizes. You'll notice there was a feature in here that we didn't see in the other screen. A couple of them actually, but we're gonna talk about custom controls real quick. The custom controls allows us to designate how different buttons operate, customization. And in the beginning, I would recommend for the most part, leaving this the way it is, because I'm going to teach it a certain way and it would be confusing otherwise. However, if you want to do something like back button focusing, you'll notice that we have the shutter button here highlighted in white. And that is telling us that when we come into this orange box, we can determine how the shutter button would work. So it's saying shutter button, the halfway press, pressing of the button, activates metering and autofocus, and it kicks me out. Well, if we wanted to take the autofocus away from that, we would just select this. In this instance, it's only going to meter, or we could select this that is going to lock our exposure settings. So it really depends on what you're trying to do, but in the beginning, I would recommend just leaving the, these by default. We have a display button setting that we can customize, our back button, autofocus on, we have tons of options in here. We can determine our set button. If you want quick access to something like, I don't know, image quality, you can determine it here. We can also customize our auto exposure lock. And I'm gonna come back out to the main menu. So that is the black information screen in changing the settings 
with the Q button. Let's talk about playing back images on the T8i. These pictures were for some uh, sports focusing tests I was doing. And you'll notice that the playback for the monitor is very similar to what we're used to with smartphones. So if you want to zoom in, you would basically put your fingers close together and spread them apart. If you want to zoom out, you would pinch together. And as we continue to do this, we can zoom out more and more. And so we can get to a very small level of detail. And then we can touch and drag. And so this little gray bar here on the right gives us an idea of how many images we have. You can see I took, you know, I take hundreds of pictures when I do these tests. And that's how we navigate. And so if we wanted to touch on an image, double tap, it'll zoom all the way in again. So pinching in and out will allow us to, to zoom in and out on different size images. We can inspect the image, we can zoom in. It's all touch sensitive, very handy, very easy to use. Before we get into the exposure lesson, I wanted to point out some of these other modes that we have on the mode dial that I don't really use that much. We talked a little bit about the dummy mode and how you can see we have very few options in terms of controlling the camera. It's really turning your camera into a point and shoot. And you didn't invest this kind of money into this kind of a camera to have a point and shoot. So I tell all of my students to just don't even bother with the dummy mode when they're getting started. Then we have the SCN or the scene modes. If you notice, we have this little icon in the top left hand corner. And the idea of the scene modes are basically the camera is going to designate the best settings for that type of shooting. The portrait here is means obviously taking pictures of people. If we press on this, you can see that we have tons of other options in terms of these different settings. We have some smooth skin, group photos, landscape images, macro photography, sports shooting, kids, food, night portraits, handheld night scene, and HDR with backlight control. It takes three consecutive so shots and then it puts them together. On the crash course, I would demonstrate this. This is probably the most useful one. And that's it. The rest of the settings, I don't recommend using this mode because it doesn't give you full control. And when you really know your camera inside and out, you're gonna be using two modes most of the time. Aperture priority and manual, maybe occasionally program mode if you're doing a lot of handheld flash. Otherwise, I never use the SCN or the scene modes. And if we were to, you know, we can come in here into the Q menu, we get a couple other options. They're not especially helpful. You can select them down here on the bottom of the screen. Flipping over to the creative modes, these are the same modes that we saw when we were navigating the Q menu. Also not super helpful, don't really use them pretty much at all. And then we are left with the P, TV, and AV modes. And I'll give you a brief overview of what these mean and what they stand for. P stands for program mode. It's an automatic mode. It's sort of like the dummy mode, but we're taking the training wheels off a little bit. You can see we have some options in here when we come into the Q menu. You know, we can change our ISO, we can change our white balance. We ha have some settings and some control over it. And I only use this mode when I'm using a strobe attached to the camera because that puts it into handheld strobe mode on Canon cameras. Otherwise, I never use it. TV stands for time value. What you'll notice in time value is that the camera allows us to enter the shutter speed, but the aperture is missing. And this is because the camera will be de determining the aperture. So if you know you want a specific shutter speed, this you'd come in here and set it, and the camera would do the aperture. I never use it, never. I never use TV mode. AV, in my opinion, is the most useful mode out of all of them if you are first getting started because it's going to teach you so much about the camera. Aperture priority mode means that we determine the aperture and the camera will be determining the shutter speed. This is going to be a little bit of a struggle if you're a pure beginner, understanding some of the concepts. I'm gonna walk you through it and, and basically describe it in such a way that it'll make sense. So watch this part of the lesson coming up. And then we have the manual mode. I think the manual mode is actually the easiest one to understand. Basically, we dial in the shutter speed 
in the aperture, in the ISO. The camera is not helping us at all. And so you can see those on the bottom here, we have our shutter speed, aperture, and ISO. If you are a pure beginner, and this is your first camera, as your instructor, I would put a lot of pressure on you to learn aperture priority mode. We dial in the aperture and the camera handles the shutter speed. How do we know this? Well, when you tap the shutter button, we can see that shutter speed. And if I am going to take my number one finger, primary finger, and put it on the primary control dial, as I rotate this, we can see the aperture is changing. And as that aperture changes, the shutter speed is also changing. The camera is making that adjustment to the shutter speed. Does it automatically? If we're in time value mode and we change our shutter speed, we can't see it right now because it's hidden. If we tap the shutter button, we can see that the camera is changing the aperture automatically for us. And that is what's happening in those two modes. We dial in one setting, the camera handles the other. When we are changing the aperture, for those of you that, that haven't, you don't have a background in photography, I highly recommend a basic photography course. I have one, it's in the link in the description. We cover it on the crash course as well. Is that aperture, those numbers are counterintuitive. So the smaller that number is, the wider the lens opening becomes. And the higher the number, if we go up to F22, the smaller the opening. So small openings let in less light. Large openings let in more light, right? So as we open the aperture and we get a wider and wider opening, you should be thinking, well, how come the image isn't changing? How come this isn't becoming brighter? It's because the camera is using a faster and faster shutter speed as we use a wider and wider aperture. You can see the shutter speed is going up. And so the camera is constantly making this balance for us to get a nice even exposure. This is what's happening in the P, TV, and AV modes. Okay, the camera is helping us. So the question then becomes, how do we make the image brighter? If we were shooting in aperture priority mode and we take a picture, let's say of these blinds, and we play it back, and it's too dark. This is one of the most important camera settings I can teach you, and this is called exposure control. So there's a long answer to this, and there's a short answer to this, and it's a little confusing. In the past, there was a special button that we had to press in order to make this work. Canon has simplified, and I think it has made it easier, in terms of how we can make the exposure compensation bar work on the bottom of our camera. Now there's a negative three there, supposed to be a negative two, a negative one, we have this little diamond home plate, and we have a plus one, a plus two, and a plus three. And below that, there's this little tick mark, and you'll see this on most cameras. The short answer is we wanna move that little tick mark to the plus side. Now, when I rotate the secondary command wheel or the directional pad, as I call it, nothing happens. What Canon wants us to do, and there's no way for you to know this without reading through the manual very carefully, tap the shutter button, and we can see the shutter speed, and now rotate to plus one, and I'm gonna take another picture. So that's the short answer, is that if you move that tick mark to the plus side, it's gonna be brighter. If you move it, to the dark side, it's gonna be darker. If this is the only thing that you come away from this in this video, you are off to a fantastic start. That's the short answer. We can control image brightness in the aperture priority mode by using the exposure compensation bar. We do it by tapping to get our shutter speed, and then we can rotate this higher or darker. And if we play those images back, here's the dark image, Here's the brighter image, and here's the even image. Extremely powerful when you're first getting started to know how to do that. Now, there is a longer answer that I'm going to go into now, and this is to give you a foundation of what is happening with the camera. And I'm going to prove some things that are pretty fast. I think they're pretty fascinating in my mind. So coming back to aperture priority mode, I want you to take your hand and slowly 
block the amount of light coming into the camera and look what's happening to the shutter speed. Uh, it disappears, I'm tapping the shutter button. You can see that the shutter speed is changing depending on how much light is entering the camera. And this is referred to as metering. Metering means the camera is measuring light constantly as it's coming in through the lens. And the camera is going to try to make adjustments to the shutter speed to compensate for the amount of light coming in. I get questions all the time. Why, why are my pictures so dark? Why is everything blurry? In almost every instance, it's because you're shooting indoors and it's dark and there's not enough light. And the moment you go outside and you're, you know, you're shooting in bright daylight, the camera is gonna have plenty of light to work with. It's gonna use a faster shutter speed, but usually the absence of light is what's causing these darker images, these blurry images. So coming back to exposure compensation and the importance of the shutter speed right here and that I'm about to demonstrate is that exposure compensation is when we give the camera permission to cheat the brightness in a specific direction. I'll prove it to you mathematically. One 160th of a second. And I'm going to move this to one tick mark. One tick mark is twice the amount of light than it was before. That's referred to as one stop. So anytime you hear a stop, we're talking about twice as much light or half as much light, depending on which direction you go in. If I'm going to the right, plus one is twice the amount of light. If I go in the opposite direction, it's half as much light as before. We can prove this mathematically when we look at the fraction of one one hundred and sixtieth of a second, if we add twice as much light, it would be like adding another one one hundred and sixtieth of a second, right? So one one hundred and sixtieth of a second plus one one hundred and sixtieth of a second is two one hundredths and sixtieths of a second. If we do the math and round down, one eightieth of a second. There it is. So what's happening with exposure compensation is for every one stop, the camera is using twice as long as a shutter speed. When we go in the opposite direction, it's using half as much. Watch this. Should be 1 3 20th. And there it is. Maybe some variation in light. If we continue to go down, it's pretty much half each time. It's a little bit off just because of the lighting situation that I'm in. If we go higher, it should be 1 80th, there it is. 1 40th, there it is. And 1 20th, and there it is. So that is what's happening with exposure compensation is that we're giving permission to the camera to cheat the exposure, be a little bit brighter, and it still maintains even when we put our hand in front of the camera. So I'm about to give you some important side notes that are that really help you when you are shooting. I'll turn the exposure down a little bit so you can see this. As a professional, and I get this question a lot, do I shoot on aperture priority mode all the time? Probably 85% of the time, I'm on aperture priority mode. The only time I shoot on manual mode is when I have enough time or I'm in a studio setting working with strobes. Those are the only two times I do it uh, because it allows me to finesse the camera settings a little bit more and strobes are a completely different ball game because we're not using an exposure simulation. But when I'm shooting a wedding, aperture priority mode. Why? Because we're in a dark chapel, you know, shooting the ceremony. Now we're in the lobby. It's a little bit brighter and I'm backing up and shooting the couple as they're leaving and now we're outdoors. Well, those are three different lighting conditions and I don't want to trip. So I'm looking where I'm standing and I also need to frame couple, I'm thinking about composition, and I have a lot on my plate. So in those instances, yeah, I turn it over to the camera and let the camera help you with the shutter speed. Same thing when I am doing sports shooting. Typically, I'm on aperture priority mode. Why? Because I can select an aperture and I let the camera handle the shutter speed if there's clouds coming in or whatnot. Now, having said that, there is a critically important note I have to make is that when you are shooting in aperture priority mode, always sneak a peek at your shutter speed. So you're shooting, shooting, shooting. Just sneak a peek to make sure your shutter speed is fast enough for the type of photography you are doing. 
if you are shooting a portrait of a person sitting, the minimum shutter speed that I would recommend is 1 60th of a second. When the shutter speed becomes slower than 1 60th of a second, it's going to be blurry. Why? Because we move holding the camera and our subject also moves. And that movement with slow shutter speeds makes things blurry. If I'm shooting a moving athlete, the shutter speed is typically at least one five hundredth of a second because they are moving faster. And I talk about this in my digital photography crash course. It's at the beginning of every camera crash course I do. I, I take you through the fundamentals of photography and shutter speed and depth of field. And this is why it's, it's critically important to get that background knowledge about photography. Otherwise, it's going to be a lot harder to, to put all these aspects together. So one sixtieth of a second for portraits, one five hundredth of a second for sports minimum. And if it's fast moving subjects like race cars or professional athletes, even faster, you know, maybe one one thousandth or one two thousandth of a second. It really depends on what you're shooting. Birds in flight, really fast. You need a fast shutter speed. But that is aperture priority mode. I know we covered a lot of information in here. This is where you should start. So I'm gonna reset the camera here real quick to an even exposure. Very important in this next, next example is to turn your ISO to 100. So we're, I'm gonna talk you through something very important. We're gonna flip it over to time value, shutter priority mode. And let's say we're shooting a sporting event where we have running athletes and we need a fast shutter speed. So here I come, I'm coming in. Okay, I need a one five hundredth of a second shutter speed. And here it is. Well, we got a problem now. Look how dark it is. And when I tap the shutter button, we get this blinking. This blinking is telling us that the lens aperture opening is maxed out. It is as wide as it'll possibly open. We can see from the preview this is going to be dark. So guess what? If we shoot this way, our images are going to not work out. It's going to be too too dark, too underexposed. So the question is, is how can we fix this? Think about it for just a minute. If your answer was to bump the ISO up, you are absolutely correct. We can come in here, we can start turning the ISO up, and you can see that the exposure preview is giving an estimate of how bright the image will be. Now we're at ISO 5000. I'm just gonna turn it up all the way to 25,600 for the sake of demonstration. And you can see that the camera chose a smaller aperture. If we go to a faster shutter speed, now we're at F8, F10, just depending. So I wanna show you what happens. There is a trade-off because beginners will say, well, why don't you just shoot at a high ISO all the time if, you, if you're getting all this extra signal boost? I'm gonna demonstrate this. So let me go with a larger focusing square. I'll play this back. I'm going to, we're going to zoom in and I'm, I'm going to show you what's happening here. Is that when we look at the edge of the blinds, we get this almost like salt and pepper everywhere along this edge. This is not a clean edge. And that is the trade off with very high ISOs. Yeah, you can bump your ISO up and it will make your image brighter in the final exposure, but we also get tons of grain. So I want to demonstrate this with a lower ISO. I'll just flip it to aperture priority mode and I'm gonna turn it down to 400, let's say. Take the same picture with the blind, zoom in. We're gonna take a look at the edge. See how much cleaner that edge is? It's a perfect line. There's no salt and pepper. And that is the trade-off when you are dealing with very high ISOs, brighter images, but more grain. Lower ISOs, less grain but you're going to need more light and so that is why we don't shoot at very high isos cameras have gotten pretty dang impressive over the years there's also the softening that happens but you can get away with 3200 a lot it just depends on what you're doing but the train of thought is to shoot with the lowest iso that you need for the shoot without messing your images up now, as a quick side note, you'll notice that we get these boxes highlighted in gray, but that also means you can change the shutter speed directly just by clicking on it and touching and dragging. Just another way to change it. If you wanted to change your exposure compensation, you could do it here. 
I, I teach to do it using the controls because this will allow you to do it while you are shooting. As you're looking through the viewfinder, you can change all these controls if you want. Let's take a look at the program mode. So you'll notice we have this option to change shutter speed here. Same with aperture priority, we can change it there. When we go to the program mode, both of those are missing. Now, the reason why this happens is because the camera is going to select the aperture and the shutter speed for us. And we can still change our exposure compensation. I'm touching the, tapping the shutter button to pull those items up to see them. And as I rotate it, you can see that the changes are happening to both settings instead of just one as we demonstrated on the aperture priority or shutter priority is the camera will we'll make changes to both of them. Not a huge fan of program mode, but it has a time and place. If you ever panic and you don't know what's going on, shoot in program mode. It's probably the next best place to start after aperture priority. Now let's talk about manual mode. I love manual mode because it gives us complete control and you will notice something interesting happening to the exposure compensation bar. It's grayed out, can't select it. Even tapping the shutter button, can't choose this. It thinks I'm wanting to focus. What's going on? In the manual mode, there is no exposure compensation. This becomes a simple metering indicator. It's telling us how bright or how dark the image is going to be. And what we're basically doing is we're dialing in a shutter speed or an aperture, and the camera is trying to give us a prediction with that bottom indicator. You know, it's going to be this bright or dark. Obviously, we're going to be using the monitor to kind of set that to taste. Something else I need to point out is that we have our exposure simulation turned on. And when you are using flash, I pull this flash guy up on the top exposure simulation turns off. And the reason is, is because we're adding a strobe. That changes everything about the exposure and the camera won't know it until we take the picture. So we're, when we're using strobes or flashes, obviously it's better to not have your exposure simulation on. Just setting that out there if you pop your flash up and you're wondering what's happening. Manual mode is wonderful because it gives us complete control over the camera. We dial in the shutter speed, we dial in the aperture, and we take the picture and we adjust it according to what we like or don't like. Now there is another setting in here that I wanna cover real quick in ISO. And this is the auto ISO feature. I don't recommend this unless you really know what you're doing because if you shoot an auto ISO, the camera is going to be changing your ISO as well as those other settings in those other three modes. So this is why I tell beginners to turn it off. For me, the most useful time to shoot an auto ISO is indoor sports where we have changing lighting conditions. Let's say you're shooting an MMA fight. Here come the fighters, the lights are flashing, and the conditions are literally changing from second to second. The camera, if you're in manual mode, will still keep that one 500th of a second F5, but it will make adjustments to the ISO. This allows us to ensure a good shutter speed with a good aperture, and still allow the camera to help us out when these conditions change. So we talked about the modes, changing image brightness, exposure compensation, recommended shutter speeds in, in different shooting conditions, and I hope you enjoyed it. Let's talk about white balance real quick. In the beginning, auto white balance is gonna get you through most of it. Uh, you know, as a pure beginner, I would just say, don't even set it to auto white balance and don't worry about it. But what will eventually happen is you'll be shooting and you'll notice your pictures, the colors off in all of them. When you notice this, it's a, like a bluish, or sometimes it's a little bit yellow. It's probably time to start setting your white balance correctly. There's a short answer to this and there's a long answer to this. I'm gonna focus on the short answer in this video. In your white balance settings, on the bottom of your monitor, we have these different icons. So as we scroll through them, left to right, we also get a definition. So the sun icon is for daylight. The shade icon is obviously for the shade. And notice how the colors are changing on the monitor. We have the cloud icon, tungsten light, it's almost bluish. White fluorescent light, it's almost purple. We have flash. We have custom white balance in 
Kelvin white balance. So the short answer is, is that when you see these color shifts in your images, put your white balance icon to the light that you are shooting in. So if you're shooting outdoors on a bright sunny day, you would set it to the sun icon. If you're shooting in shade, it would be the shade icon. Cloud, tungsten light. Tungsten is incandescent bulbs, light bulbs. You know, if you're shooting indoors with light bulbs, you would want it here. And you would have to change it every time the lighting condition changes. Now, the human eye is amazing. It makes these adjustments automatically. And we see pretty much these changes happen immediately when we go from indoors to outdoors. Cameras cannot do it as well. and We have to give the cameras some help. You can notice we have this almost like gold, gold yellowish kind of look. There are going to be times that you will be shooting in mixed lighting conditions, which has multiple light sources. You can be shooting a wedding and you'll have fluorescent, incandescent, and shade all in one image, right? So this is where the custom white balance comes in. It's this icon here on the bottom. So this is a little confusing, but once you know how to do it, it's pretty straightforward. I have done this many times at weddings using a, a bride's dress or a wall or a ceiling or a white piece of paper. I'm going to take a picture of the blinds, which are white, and then I need to come into the menu and tell the camera which image that I took that was pure white. Here it is. I'm going to hit the set button. Do you want to use the white balance data for this image? Yes. Okay. And then I'm going to make sure that I am on my custom icon. And now I have custom white balance my camera, and it's a beautiful white. Again, best for mixed lighting conditions when you're shooting JPEG or video. If you are shooting RAW, RAW retains pretty much all of the color information and you could usually fix it in post. But JPEG in videos, more important to get this right. That is how we custom white balance. Now there is one more color balance setting that is Kelvin. When we select that and hit set, when I push to the right, this number, this Kelvin number, you can see it's getting this golden yellow color when that number is very high. And when we go down in the opposite direction, it'll start getting really, really blue. What is going on here? This is part of a much deeper answer when we get into the philosophy of use of color balance. Suffice to say, the color temperature here is referring to the temperature of the light you're shooting in. And in most cases, light bulbs will tell you, well, high quality light bulbs will tell you. Incandescent light is about 32 to 3400. And incandescent light is also very yellow. So what's happening is the camera is adding blue to counterbalance the yellow of incandescent light. That Kelvin setting is a, it's, it's a scientific reference for different light sources. 5600 is referred to as sunlight. That's what daylight is recognized. It's 5600 Kelvin. And then when we get into twilight shooting, when things start getting a little bit more blue, you can see that the camera is adding more and more yellow in here. Kelvin temperature is probably something most beginners shouldn't wor worry about. But if you're a videographer, this is going to become very important because video on the T8i is JPEG. It's a form of JPEG, and we want to get the color right in camera anytime we're shooting JPEGs. So that is a quick introduction to white balance. You'll notice we also have the ability to change the type of auto white balance from ambient priority to white priority. There's a very slight shift in here. And we also have this info, which is the white balance shift that allows us to skew the white balance towards blue, green, amber, or magenta. I only use this on Panasonic cameras because I, I feel like the Panasonic cameras are just a little bit off and I tweak them. I never use it, I've never used this on a Canon camera in 17 years of shooting Canon. I've never used white balance shift to the best of my recollection. So that is white balance. Let's talk about how the camera meters. And this has to do with the camera's metering modes. So to access the metering modes, again, we're looking right here, right there. It says metering mode and we get these different shapes. And when we scroll to the left and right, we see evaluative, this is a good general place to start. We have partial metering, we have spot metering, and center weighted. 
The easiest way for me to describe this is with the spot metering mode. So that's that's why I've selected spot. And you can see that we get this little circle here in the middle. So I want you to watch these camera settings here on the bottom, 1 60th of a second, f5.6. Remember light is constantly being measured as we come in here. So I have my light, it's really not that, that bright. And I'm going to move it around away from that circle, I'm trying to stay away from that circle. You'll notice the camera settings are not changing. What's happening here is that spot metering mode is measuring light only from the center circle. And that's what metering modes are all about. We use these different shapes to tell the camera where to look for light. Watch what happens when I put the light right over that circle. See how dark it gets? And if I tap the shutter button, now we have a much faster shutter speed. And the camera is actually saying it's, it's overexposed here. It's so bright. It's, it's just overexposed from this light and it's adjusting with a fast shutter speed to try to compensate for it. The moment I move it out, here it comes. And that's what, so that's what metering modes are really all about, selecting the shape that you want the camera to measure light from. Evaluative is a great place to start if you're a beginner. It breaks the frame up into different zones and it's measuring according to Canon's algorithm. Those are really the two that I use the most. There is a center weighted average, which basically expands the center a little bit and adds an average of the corners. And then we have a partial metering mode. But in the beginning, evaluative and spot, I think are the easiest ones to start with and to learn. And that is your metering modes. It's how the camera is measuring light coming into the viewfinder. Let's talk about all the ways we can focus with the T8i. And this can be very intimidating because there are many ways to focus with the camera. In the method that we choose is going to change depending on the type and subject matter that we're shooting in. And this is where a lot of the confusion comes in. The easiest way to remember this and to think about this in any situation is the how, the when, and the where. How, when, and where. If you think of it in these terms, focusing is going to be easy. So how does the camera focus? Well, we're, when we're in a photographic mode, meaning we're just taking pictures, almost all cameras in the world focus with a halfway shutter button depression of our shutter button. Pushing the button halfway down engages the focusing systems and we can see that we get this green box, we get a beep, pushing it down all the way will take the picture. Something that we have on the T8i is we have back button focusing as well. We can push this to engage our focusing systems. As we mentioned earlier, we can also touch on our monitor when it's active, and this will also help us to engage the camera's focusing systems. So those are three ways of, in terms of how we can focus. The next part of this is the camera's focusing modes. This is the when the camera will focus. To access the camera's focusing modes, we are going to push right on our directional pad. It's right here, AF. The camera's focusing modes in live view are going to be accessed by pressing the Q menu, and then we're going to select right here, one shot or servo. One shot is just like it sounds. What this means is that the camera is going to focus one time, and as long as we hold that shutter button halfway down, the focusing systems will remain locked. And what this will allow me to do is to get a focusing lock, and then I can move the camera to recompose. This is a very common technique that I go over in my crash courses because sometimes you kind of be in a hurry, you want to get focus lock and then change the composition just a little bit. So recomposing, halfway shutter button depression, you move the camera a little bit, pushing it down all the way will take the picture. I'm also noticing that as I'm shooting, I'm dropping down to this 1 50th of a second. So I'm going to open up my aperture a little bit to make sure I stay at 1 60th just for the sake of following my own rules. So the second focusing mode in here is servo. Servo is a predictive focus. And this means the camera is going to be focusing over and over and over again. It's not once, it's many times as long as we are holding that shutter button halfway down. And you'll notice that when we do this, the box turns blue instead of green. We do not hear the beep. We do not get a single focus lock. And as we recompose, the camera is refocusing over and over again. So this is the difference between one shot, which focuses once, and continuous, which focuses many times over. So one shot will engage the camera's focusing systems once. This is ideal 
for subjects that do not move, maybe landscape, photography, maybe a cooperating human, for example. And there are going to be times that we are going to want to shoot a moving subject. The problem with moving subjects is that the focusing systems need to be updated continuously. And this is why we have the servo mode. When we are in the servo mode, engaging the camera's focusing systems results in a blue box. We do not get a beep. And if we were to focus on something and move the camera, holding the shutter button halfway down, the camera is focusing and refocusing over and over and over again. This works really well when combined with a high frame rate shutter. We're taking multiple images and the camera is focusing between every single shot. Birds in flight, maybe kids running around, sports, things of that nature. So when we're talking about the camera's focusing modes, the when, one shot is once, servo is many times over and over again. Now, some of you will notice that we have an auto focus mode button on our directional pad. And when we're in live view, if we push on that button, you can see that it's just moving our focusing squares. So we can change the position of our focusing squares using the directional pad. What this means is this quick menu is really designed to work when we're not in live view. So if I were to push up, we can get white balance. If I push to the right, we have our auto focus modes. If we were to push down, we have our picture styles. And if we push to the left, we have our drive modes. So something you will notice is that when I pushed into the auto focus modes, when we're not in live view, we get the third missing focusing mode. One shot is the same as it was in live view. AI servo is the same as it was in live view, but what is AI focus? AI focus is a hybrid of the two. And when we select this, essentially we're giving the camera permission to decide on whether, to, whether or not to use one shot or AI servo. This was something that I used to use a long time ago when I was shooting weddings and the bride would be walking and now she's stopped and now she's moving and now she's dancing. And for the most part, I don't really use it anymore. I usually just bounce back and forth between one shot. And if they're moving and stopping, I, I just stick with AI servo. That's just personal preference. Just keep in mind that when we are shooting through the optical viewfinder, we have this third mode available. So we've talked about the how we engage. We've talked about the when the camera is focusing. Now let's talk about the where. This is easier for me to teach on the back monitor, but the principles apply when choosing the focusing squares through the optical viewfinder. If we get enough response and you guys enjoy this, I'll make a special lesson on the optical viewfinder. So coming in to live view, when we're using the back monitor, I personally believe this is super easy to touch on the monitor, telling the camera where we want to focus. And you can see I can get almost all the way over to the edge and absolutely to the top and bottom of the monitor as well and we can select these different focusing points. There's more to this in that there are different types of squares that I'm about to demonstrate. So what it wants us to do is to come into the Q mode, and I'm going to press this here, and here are our auto-focusing methods, and you can see I have it on face detection and tracking. So we'll come back to that in just a second. When I'm using a single square, oh, I messed up. See, this, is, this sometimes happens when we, when we use the touch monitor. I want to choose this guy right here one point autofocus. So when I have this one square selected, all I need to do is touch the monitor and I can focus on that position. I have AI servo on, let me turn that back to a regular single shot. Very useful, very common for general purpose shooting. But let's say I was shooting macro and I wanted to get a really tight focus position. Well, we have this spot autofocus. And what you'll notice is the square becomes much smaller and precise. So if we're doing very shallow depths of field, for example, very useful. There's another one in here. If we come back to our focusing modes, it's over here, zone AF. And in zone AF, we get a much larger box and we're telling the camera to look within this four cornered box to find an area of contrast. You can see as, as I'm moving this box around, it's mostly picking up 
on my focusing target. This particular focusing square is better for super fast moving subjects, maybe birds in flight, where we can get a general area, but things are moving around. And so the smaller your box gets, the harder it is to focus on fast moving subjects. So those are the three general focusing squares. But if we come back in, we see this guy on the top here, face detection. Face detection and tracking. The way this mode works is that it is looking for a human face within the frame. If it doesn't find it and we touch on the monitor, we are activating a tracking feature. And you can see that that square is following the target that I've set up. It has improved greatly over the years. In the beginning, it wasn't, it wasn't the greatest. And you know, if it got too small, it was easy to trick. It's very good right now. Uh, it's the best I've seen on Canon cameras within the last year. There's a couple cameras that have come out very good. So Canon has done a lot of hard work on this. In a single focusing mode, we still have to engage the focusing systems. In AI servo, especially in video mode, this will update automatically. So when we push and we keep that halfway down, it will update as well. And you can see that we get this, this tracking from frame to frame. It's basically saying it's gonna look for this subject within those four corners. So I'm going to put up a picture of a model. So there's our handsome model. And now that we have a face into the shot, you can see that the camera has a preference for face, the face detection. And this is size dependent, is that if we get it small enough, at some point, it, it will fail, it'll give up. But again, it's, it's gotten really good recently. Something that you should note is that when we are using this face detection, we have this info eye, it's on disable. If I turn that on to enable, now we have eye detection. This is incredibly useful for portrait photographers because we want at least one of the eyes to be in focus. So if you are shooting a portrait, this is definitely the focusing mode that you're going to want. You will also notice that we get these flashing arrows here on the bottom, and this is going to allow us to choose which eye we want the camera to focus on. When you have two or more faces, we have the ability to select between those faces as well. But for wide aperture lenses, talking about you know like 1.8 or 2.0, when we have a very shallow depth of field, this is the best way to shoot a portrait because we get that eye focusing lock. Now, one of the great features about the T8i is that we also have eye detection in video. It's going to work in a very similar fashion in that the video shooting will focus on the eye of your subject. And as they're walking to or away from the camera, the dual pixel autofocus will update smoothly. It's really pretty impressive. And that is just another focusing tool. So we got face detection, eye detection, tracking. We have the different size squares. And a lot of this is, operates the same is that when we jump out of live view and you do this through the optical viewfinder and you press your focus square selector here or up near the uh, top of the primary selector, we have slightly different clusters. You can see that we have the ability to have a, a one point, which is similar to spot. We have a nine zone, and you, we can move these around using the directional pad as we're looking through the viewfinder. We, we have a larger zone, which is one of these three areas. And then we have an auto selection, auto focus area, which is really telling the camera to look uh, for the area of highest contrast within the focus squares available. It's something that beginners would use. So I don't really use it that often, but we can toggle through those by pressing the auto focus cluster selector next to the primary selector wheel. The one I use the most is single and occasionally the nine squared, but it'll highlight the focusing squares. And again, if there's enough interest, I can make a video that will demonstrate how this works. Something else I need to point out, is that we have a number of very cool manual focusing tools that I would like to point out. The easiest way to jump into manual focus is on your lens switch. Go from AF to MF. So I turn that to MF and you can see we're in manual focus. We can change our manual focus by rotating the focusing wheel on the front end of the lens. Most lenses have a manual focusing wheel. 
and uh, you need to be in manual focus for them to work. Now, there are some cool things about this I want to demonstrate. I'm going to, I am going to bump it up to be a little bit brighter so we can see here. I'm out of focus right now, right? And one of those focusing tools is the ability to do a manual zoom. So did you see what I did there? We have a magnifying glass on the far right grip here. There's a plus and there's a minus. So when I push that in, it zooms in. So I'm going to aim this over basically my face. I can scroll up using my directional pad. And this is what I call manual zoom focusing. I can zoom in closer and get a precise focus. And then press zoom in one more time and it kicks me out. So this is very common for videography when you don't want your focusing changing. Manual zoom focusing, there's a number of ways we can do it. Canon has also recently started putting in some really great tools uh, for focusing, one of which is referred to as manual focus peaking settings. The peaking settings is basically a color overlay that allows us to see the areas of greatest contrast. So when we turn this on, we have it on level high, the color is red. Hard to, to see right now, but as you zoom in, you'll notice it disappears. So this is only going to work when you are zoomed out. It's this little faint red outline. I don't know how well you can see that, but it's there. And peaking is another focusing tool that allows us to see where the camera is currently focusing. It's more, more based on contrast, but it is a viable and useful tool. I use it very often. I turn this off. We have different colors. We have yellow. Let's see what yellow looks like. You can kind of see it just a little bit. And um, I come in here and turn that off for now. I know many of you will ask and wonder about back button focusing for sport shooting. It's pretty easy to set up. I'm going to jump out of live view. Press the Q button. Coming into my button setup. Here's my shutter button halfway depression. I'm going to select this second one. So we're turning off the auto focus for the shutter button. Hit OK. And at this point, the camera would be set up for back button focusing so I could engage the AF on. And when I push the shutter button, it just takes the picture. If you don't do this, every time we push a shutter button halfway down, the camera is going to refocus. And for sports shooters, it kind of creates a problem where you have a running athlete that stops and you want to recompose. Well, if you recompose and you're now focused on the background, now your, your subject's not going to be in focus. And this is why sports shoot shooters turn it off and use the AF on button is because they just simply want to know when the camera is focusing and when they lift their thumb up, it's in manual mode, basically. And that's the reason why people use back button focusing. I'm going to change it back to where it was before, because when I don't, I always say, oh, what's going on with the camera? And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a quick overview of the many different ways we can focus with our Canon Rebel T8i. Think of it as the how, the when, and the where the focusing squares are, and you are going to be in great shape. Before we dive into the deep menu of the camera, something I want to demonstrate is the video mode. So when we push this lever forward, we're now in the video mode. You'll notice that it's punching in a little bit simply because I'm shooting in a crop mode for 4K video. Something to keep in mind, and there are some different resolution settings that we'll talk about when we get into the menu section, is we have different menus, slightly different menus for video recording than we do for stills. You'll notice that these menus are a little bit different, right? For the sake of this demonstration, I am going to shoot in a non 4K mode so we don't have this punch in. There we go. And I want to point out a couple things real quick that are that are pretty important. I prefer to shoot on manual. And you'll notice that we get our shutter speed and our aperture when we're on manual. I'm going to turn this ISO to maybe 800. And I'll cover this in the crash course is that we there is a certain way to set this up depending on your frame rate. So if you saw here, I'm, I'm shooting at 60 frames per second. I could shoot at 30 frames per second when I'm using full HD. Whatever your frames per second, you want to double that to determine your shutter speed. 
in order to get a film like look. So if I'm shooting at 60 frames per second, my shutter speed is going to be 1 125th of a second. And then I choose my aperture that I want and I adjust at the very end with my ISO. So in regards to exposure, this is how I do it. When we are talking about focusing, there's a couple really fantastic tools in here. We got the eye detection. And in video, what will happen is the camera will automatically update the focusing itself. We don't have to push a shutter button down for this to happen. The camera is going to do it normally just as we're shooting. And that is the servo AF feature. If you do not want that on, you toggle it so the screen dot is no longer there and it is paused. Something else that's critically important for me to note on this is the camera's audio levels. To find them in the deep menu, we're going to go to red tab, page one, sound recording, auto, and we're going to turn this to manual. When we do this, you can see that we have these channel levels that are telling us when the audio sound is clipping out. And if you're recording high quality audio, you must monitor this or else you're going to run into problems. Yellow is okay, but what we don't want to see is red. We want to see these nice peaks in here, in this range. We don't want to see red and we don't want it to be too low. If you leave it on the auto setting, what will happen is the camera will automatically add boost to the, to the signal coming in. And so when you have somebody talking, it'll get louder. And when they're quiet, it'll drop and you get this constant fluctuation. So I never use the auto audio set, setting for the microphone. And um, you, you know, definitely, absolutely get an external microphone. I, I, I make the most affordable, high quality mi microphone, in my opinion, on the market. It's the Maven Mini Mic. And I will put that link in the description, but there's tons of other great microphones out there. It's just that, you know, some of them are pretty expensive. You know, not everybody has $900 to get started. So keep this in mind. If you want to do high-end video recording, the audio is critically important. I'm going to tap the shutter button to come back out. You'll notice that we have the zoom feature. The digital zoom is not working. It's because of the resolution we have selected. So if I come in and I choose standard full HD, now we can come in and do our digital zoom. There it is. Just a nice little feature to punch in a little bit more. Obviously, I have face detection on here. But something that we could do is we could use a single square and come back, turn auto servo on. And this is very common in Hollywood films is that we use touch to pull focus. Cool that we get our audio levels. Very important to be able to see that as we're recording. But this feature allows us to touch on different parts of the viewfinder to change our focus. Obviously, we don't want to hear the beep, right? So we would come in and turn the beep off just to disable it. So when we're recording something, we can touch to focus. Very powerful tool. It has gotten better over the years. In the past, we had to use you know, special gear assembly assemblies and wheels and have a person dedicated to doing this. And this has made it so easy for a single person to change the focus you know, just touching on the screen. I will demonstrate this on the crash course if we have one. And in any event, that is a quick overview of the video shooting, and we're ready to jump into the deep menu section. Let's take a look at the deep menu system. And something I need to point out is the menu system will display differently depending on what mode you're in. So if I am in the green dummy mode and I hit the menu button, you will notice that some of the tabs are missing. Some of the pages are missing. And when we turn it to P, time value or aperture value or manual, we get some of those pages back. Another important thing to note is that when I flip it forward to the video mode, and then I go into the deep menu, some of the options in here are changed. So the deep menu is not consistent. It depends on what mode we have selected. For this first part, we're gonna be talking about most of the pages that you would see on aperture priority mode or manual mode, program mode, shutter priority mode, because those menus have most of the features. So we can come back in. The way we navigate in the deep menu system is that there are different colored tabs at the top. And I think it's easier to touch them because this is a touch monitor, obviously. And the colors, different colors mean different things. And beneath each of those colored tabs, 
we have individual pages. So the red tab has five different pages and you can touch it, but sometimes you'll miss and hit a different color. So you may prefer scrolling left and right with the directional pad. And then under each page, we have the actual menu features themselves. So there's tons of features in here. For the sake of time, I'm going to focus on the most often changed features, at least in my opinion. And if we do a uh, crash course, we'll go into each of these a little bit deeper, the ones we don't cover, things of that nature. The red tab is for shooting. The blue tab is for playback. The purple tab has to do with different types of connectivity, including Wi-Fi and remote shooting. The yellow tab is the camera setup. And you'll notice in the end here, we have our custom functions. This used to be under an orange tab on the T8i. It is in the yellow tab on the last page. We have this aqua color, which deals with different types of prompts when we're uh, scrolling through our menus and displays, modes. And then we have the customizable My Menu tab. So coming into page one of the red tab, image quality, this is how we determine what files we are writing to our memory card. Raw files is all of the data as it's originally captured. And we, if we just wanted to shoot raw, we would go to this minus sign and take away the JPEG. Raw files tend to be larger, a lot larger, but there's a lot more color information. And the rule of thumb is basically, if you're doing an important shoot, or if you're shooting in mixed lighting conditions, raw is probably a good idea. The exception would be, is if you're shooting sports or maybe an event that has thousands of images and your workflow becomes you know, pretty important. You know, when I shot weddings, four or 5,000 images, so certain shots I would shoot in RAW, but the candids, you know, the reception, most of those were in JPEG. So it really depends on what you're doing. And what you'll notice is depending on your selection, we get the dimensions of the image and the number of shots remaining if we were to shoot with these different qualities. Now there is also C-RAW, Compact RAW, uh, which basically retains most of the color information. It's a much smaller file size. You can see we get a lot more images between those two, between the original RAW in C-RAW, Compact RAW. And we also have our JPEG. So if we don't shoot in RAW and we just shoot in JPEG, look at the number of shots that we can take. Now, some of you will be asking, you know, what is the difference between this smooth L and the jagged L? And this has to do with compression. So we turn the RAW images off. If you look at the difference between the smooth L and the jagged L, we get about twice as many shots, even though they are the same resolution. How is this possible? Compression is essentially when the processor decides that two adjacent pixels are so close to each other that it's just gonna name them, as, it's gonna say these are the same color and it throws away some color information. When I was first getting started, I tried to you know, print up these almost poster size images with uh, smooth L and jagged L, and I could not see the difference between them. So this is happening on a very fine level. And uh, I don't think most normal people could see the difference between smooth L and jagged L. So when I am shooting JPEG, I usually shoot jagged L, and that surprises a lot of people. When we come into the M, M stands for medium. It's 11 megapixels. We get the dimensions here, and obviously thousands of images. And when we're dealing with these smaller file sizes, you're, you know, we're talking about tens of thousands of images. Small file sizes, six megapixels, I don't really recommend that unless you're doing something like uh, pictures for eBay, where you're constantly taking pictures for the internet. That makes some sense, but for the most part, I tell beginning photographers, start on L, you can always downsize if you need to. So that's a quick run through on quality. Uh, I save the RAWs for important shoots. I usually recommend something like that to start. Aspect ratio, I just recommend three by two. Those are the dimensions of the sensor. And when we shoot with a different aspect ratio, we're not using all the resolution. We can always crop later if we need to. The review duration is how long the image will play back when you review it. We can release the shutter without the card. If this is turned off, the camera won't let you take a picture with this feature unless you have a card in. Lens aberration correction is a great feature. Every camera manufacturer has this. It's essentially software that will clean up the lens that you are shooting with if it is from the same manufacturer in the case of Canon, especially their newer lenses. Lenses are not perfect. There's defects, there's vignetting, 
chromatic aberration. And what Canon is doing here is building software into the camera to clean up the, the mistakes in the JPEGs. Now, in the past, I used to think this only happened with JPEGs, but I've learned since then, it also kind of happens to a degree with RAW, where the camera manufacturers are hiding these, these flaws in their lenses uh, when there is when it's connected to another Canon camera. It's a lot to go into. Suffice it to say, if you're just getting started, I would recommend turning these on because it's going to clean up a lot of the a lot of these problems. Flash control, we do have a built-in flash, which is activated by lifting up, and you just pull it up and put, put it down. It's a very small flash, it's very close to the lens. It's not what I would say is a professional lens, but if you have nothing else, it can really save you in certain backlit situations. Uh, you'll run into a problem when you're using a, a wider lens, and you'll get the shadow where it, you know, the, the flash basically creates this arced oval shadow. So if you're serious about flash, I recommend the Godox TT685C. It's very similar to Canon's flagship speed light, the 600 EXRT. That, that flash is, you know, $500. So start with the Godox. There's a lesson on it on the crash courses. Every crash course we have, we, we cover that flash. 45 minutes to an hour crash course on flash systems. This menu, will allow you to control the built-in flash as well as a Canon speed light when it's connected. Uh, kind of beyond the scope of this lesson, but we can you know, turn it off. We have different red eye reductions where it'll pulsate you know, before it takes the picture to dilate the pupils. We have our sync speed. We have built-in flash settings. And there is also the ability to trigger wirelessly using the built-in flash. Shutter sync is when the flash fires. Is it at the beginning? That would be the first curtain or the end of the exposure, second curtain. And exposure, flash exposure compensation is the brightness of the flash. So we can come in here and we can make the flash brighter or darker. When we are interested in using the built-in flash for remote firing, there's an easy wireless, which basically does all of the settings for you. You can see that everything's grayed out. We also have the ability to do custom wireless. In order for this to work, we have to have a compatible speed light, probably going to be Canon speed lights that have the firmware that will work with the T8i. Um, there is a remote transmitter for that Godox TT685. It's like 60 bucks, and I typically just throw it on the flash. but if you go the Canon route, you can use the flash as an optical transmitter, and it will allow you to come in here and change the channel, the different flash ratios. It's, it's a lot to go into. I have speed light crash courses on the 580 and the 600 EXRT, if that interests you. And for the most part, when I deal with changing the flash settings, I do it from the flash unit itself. I don't really do it from the menu system anyway. So that is the first page. I'm gonna close the flash. Page two, exposure compensation, auto exposure bracketing is a fancy way of saying, we're gonna have the camera take three images. We have our regular exposure compensation bar, which we can shift. So in the manual mode, you wouldn't see exposure compensation. So I'm gonna flip this over to aperture priority, come back in. And now we have the ability to increase or decrease, just like we did exposure compensation. The difference is in this time is that when we rotate the primary selector wheel, we get these three little tick marks that two of them break off from the center and we can shift those in different directions. Now, what these tick marks mean is that the camera is going to take three exposures about two stops apart. Come down, line it up. You can see minus two, zero, plus two. And this is really useful in certain situations where you have a high dynamic range, you know, bright highlights, dark shadows, and you want to make sure you have an image for each of them. In the past, we used to do this with merging images in Photoshop. It is a tool that every serious camera should have, and it is called auto exposure bracketing because the camera is going to take all three images and hit OK. Our ISO speed settings uh, basically allows us to control things like the maximum for auto ISO, or we can just select the ISO, current ISO we want. Pretty straightforward. 
Auto lighting optimizer is a contrast boost. Typically we see it in the JPEGs. Some people love it, but I would recommend not going to high, just maybe standard if it's something you wanna check out. Highlight tone priority is something I actually leave turned off. And this feature is meant to capture the detail in very bright highlights. When we have bright highlights, sometimes they get blown out and they're pure white. So turning this on would allow the camera to cheat in the direction of the highlights just a little bit. And I don't like that personally. I, I prefer to learn the camera and to expose for the highlights. The metering mode, we talked about the metering modes. It's how the camera is measuring light coming into the lens, different place to select them. Here we have our white balance. Again, we've talked about all these. Kind of cool that it lists the Kelvin temperature for each of them. Then we have our custom and Kelvin. We talked about custom white balance and how to use this to set it up. We have our white balance shift. We also have the ability to bracket. So we can bracket the white balance in different colors if we wanted to. I have never used that on a Canon camera. Canon cameras are usually pretty good with their colors and white balance. Color space, unless you're shooting for a magazine and you know you need Adobe RGB, I would say stick with sRGB. And then our picture styles, a little confusing. These are basically recipes that give the camera instructions about what colors to keep and which ones to throw away. Each picture style has its own set of colors built into it. For example, portraits are going to be, they're supposed to be more flesh tone friendly and landscape has more vivid blues and greens. Obviously, if you're shooting out nature and there's other presets in here, monochrome, faithful, neutral, if you're just getting started, auto and standard are fine. So you're probably wondering, what are these other symbols and what do they do? Well, if you press info, we see that these symbols have to do with sharpness, contrast, saturation, and color tone. And this is why in the beginning I say, don't worry about messing around with these. If you become more advanced and you have a specific reason, you know, have at it. Videographers experienced videographers trying to get it right in camera. A lot of them will turn down their saturation and contrast and sharpness, and they'll try to shoot it closer to what looks like a log profile and then add it back in and post. And then we can also add our custom picture styles. And, and for the most part, for beginners, I just say, don't worry about this right now. If it comes to a point that you wanna you know, experiment with it and you're comfortable with some of the other things we talked about in the video, then at that time, go for it. Page four, long exposure noise reduction is anything over a second. So if we shoot longer than a second and we have random noise in the sensor, this is supposed to smooth it out, clean it up a little bit. If you want this to happen, you would just turn this on. I have mine turned off. High ISO speed noise reduction, I have it on standard. It, it is recommended. I think it looks pretty good. It's, it's gotten great over the years. I remember the first Canon camera I got, I mean, anything over 800 was pretty grainy. And with, with noise reduction now, you can take pictures at 3200, sometimes even more. There was like a Canon 6D that was, looked great at 12,800. It depends on what you're shooting and how much light, but suffice it to say, put it on standard if you are just getting started. Dust Delete Data is a software solution to clean up dust specks on your sensor. It's not what I recommend. What I recommend is keep your sensor clean, know how to check it for sensor dust, and have the confidence in the tools to clean it anytime you need, especially before a big, important shoot. I remember a wedding shoot we did once, and, and there was just a sensor speck, and we had to go into every image and clean it up because they were important images. But yeah, the software solution, I've never used it. Live view shoot enable. This simply enables live view shooting. If you turn this off, you will not be able to jump into live view. So I recommend leaving it on. And the anti-flicker shooting tells the camera to detect when we're shooting in certain sodium-based lights or flickering lights, fluorescent lights. And the idea on this is the camera will time the exposure to be consistent between those flickers of light. So coming to page five. So a lens electronic manual focus deals with specific Canon lenses that is asking for instructions like, what do you want the lens to do if it searches and it doesn't find anything? Do you want it to give up or do you want it to have this uh, manual focus after one shot autofocus? So if you, unless you have a specific lens, it's not going to apply. And then the autofocus assist beam firing for speed lights, 
definitely recommend leaving this on enable. So that is the first tab, We've covered all five pages. Blue tab, a lot of this is pretty straightforward. Protect images allows us to put a key icon on select images or an image range. We can come in here and basically put the key icon on here. And what happens when we do this is the camera will not let us delete it. And even when you transfer it to a computer, sometimes the computer won't allow you to do it. I find myself tripping over, over them. So I never, I never key protect my images. I upload them to my folder, make a backup, and I pretty much keep everything unless I know it's terrible. And if it's terrible, I, I usually delete it on the spot. Many times I have looked at an image while I'm shooting on the back monitor. And I think, oh, that's, you know, that's a bad image. And I get home and I see it on a, on a large screen. I'm like, oh, this is actually fine. There's nothing wrong with it. So I don't really chimp and delete like I used to. It has to be like completely dark or overexposed before I'll delete it. But we can apply the protection to all images on a folder. We can unprotect everything. Pretty straightforward. We can rotate the stills and the images by pressing the set button. If you're shooting in portrait orientation. The change movie rotate info is a new feature. It's really designed to allow us to rotate uh, movies to fit in the portrait orientation for smartphones. So as I press the set button, you can see where, where it's pointing to the top, top over here, top over here, or top up. We can erase images either one at a time, or we can do it by a range or in a folder, the whole card. Uh, deleting images from the card is different than reformatting the card. I typically reformat once I have a couple backups. The print order, uh, we can connect to certain printers. We can print straight from the camera. I almost never do this because most of them have memory card readers and they're faster, just plug them in. Photo book setup, never used it. And then we have the creative filters. We've talked about these already in the mode lesson. It's kind of fun to play with, but these allow us to apply after we have taken the picture. Same with raw image processing. If you were to take a raw image, you'd be given some options to process raw files in here. We can also apply the creative assist looks if we wanted to, again, in post-processing, quick raw processing, red eye correction. So the red eye correction is if you have somebody with red eyes, this would basically fill it in with black. It doesn't really look the greatest. We can create an album. There's a lot of tools in here I've, I've never even used on Canon cameras. We can crop an image if we wanted to, pressing the set button. So there's different options in terms of what we want to do if you want to tilt it in one, one direction or another. This is basically for people that, you know, they want to do some kind of editing. We can change the aspect ratio. Come in here. So we're toggling through the different aspect ratios. Save it as a new file come back out. We can resize, add a rating. So if uh, this is will be respected by Lightroom and Bridge. So if you think you have a great image, just come in here, hit the set button. You can see the one moving across that'd be a five star image. So when I import that into Photoshop or Lightroom, I apply a filter, I, I would see that image. I do that sometimes if I know I have a great image. The slideshow was something we used to do in weddings. Back in the day, we would shoot the, re, you know, the ceremony and we'd be getting to the reception and we'd plug the camera in real quick and run an, it was an audio video cable out. And we just, you know, play the images so people could see it. Our clients loved it. This is the same idea, except it works with the HDMI cable. You plug it into your, you know, compatible monitor or TV and you can play images right off the camera. Set image search conditions. So the idea of the filter allows us to select certain criteria that, you know, if we have thousands of images and we only want to see the five-star ones, we would come in and say, just show us the five-star ratings or, you know, two or lower or three or lower. So it, it allows us to choose to tell the camera what to play back. We can do it by star. We can do it by date. We can do it by the folder, protected, different file types, clear it all out, and it'll show us all the images again. Jump image with the primary selector wheel means that when we are playing back images and we rotate the primary selector wheel, it's showing us every 10 images. And you know, when I go out and do these shoots, we take hundreds of images. So if we wanted to jump 
specify more. Let's see here. Specified images, let's say 30. It would allow me to do that. We could jump by date, by folder, movies, stills only. So sometimes the question will be like, okay, so let's say you jump to an image. So I'm jumping by 30. And then when I get there, I can go through them individually. I can still do the, should be able to do the pension. There it goes. And so it's just to help you navigate and to find images from a specific criteria. Fourth page, our histogram display right now is brightness. If we wanted to show it as RGB, we could. And I'll show you the difference. So we'll double tap. When I press the info button, we get which image out of how many, the EXIF data. If we continue to press it, then we get the RGB, uh, the histogram. And that's what this is telling us is we want a brightness or RGB. We can display the auto focus point. And this is turned on. You'll see a little red box. It designates which focusing square was used, not so much where the camera was focusing. Those are two different things. We can view from the last images we played back. So if we look at an image and we start shooting and we look again, we'll view it from the last scene image. And then we have our HDMI, HDR output. So if you wanted to output to the HDMI with HDR, you would need to come in here and turn this on. Coming into the purple tab, if I have enough time, I will walk you through the Wi-Fi lesson, basically show you how to connect to Canon's Camera Connect app and how to shoot re remotely and wirelessly. It's Sometimes the app has some bugs in it, depending on the camera, but uh, for the most part, Canon's app is pretty good. And then we get into the yellow tab. And the yellow tab is basically the camera settings. We can select which folder we're shooting in. This is going to allow us to create a new folder if we wanted to. And there were times when I was shooting every day, I'd have different shoots. I would I'd create a folder for each and every different shoot when I was doing that. File numbering, continuous means that when you change your memory cards, the numbering will continue where you left off and you can do a manual reset. The auto reset means that every time you change your memory card, it starts, starts off at 0001, the file number. Auto rotate, definitely recommend leaving it on this setting, on for the camera and the computer. Basically means that when we rotate the camera, it will automatically rotate the images for us. Format memory card. Make sure that you always have two backups before you do this. I have some friends, really good friends, that they had one hard drive and it crashed and they lost years of images. So always make sure that you have two copies minimum. Amazon Prime uh, has a, a free backup for a cloud. So pretty good idea to have them in different places, like one on a hard drive and then maybe one set on the cloud, but it depends on how much shooting you do. Completely different discussion. But once I've made my backups, then I come in and I format my memory card. Auto power off, we've talked about already. So if, if you want your camera to shut off sooner, you could come in here and program it for one minute, two minutes, four minutes. Our display screen, we want to make it brighter or darker. Sometimes when we're shooting outdoors, it's kind of hard to see and we'll turn it up a little bit. We have our date and time and zone settings, different languages to choose from. Canon has a huge number of languages for their cameras. So just depending on what your native tongue is and what you want, what you, how you prefer the menus. Coming into the video system, NTSC here in the United States, uh, many countries ac across the world are using PAL. Just depends on what you're using for your video system. This is, good. this is going to be helpful when shooting video. Touch control, definitely recommend standard. Sensitive is like if you brush the screen, sometimes it'll change it. Beep is the audio signals. We've turned this off, but it, it engages for focusing, things of that nature. We have our battery information, a brand new battery, It'll tell you the performance over time. This will have fewer and fewer of these green boxes. Sensor cleaning. When we turn the camera on or off, there's an automatic cleaning that vibrates. Uh, basically, it's a filter that fits over the sensor. Having this on enable means it'll happen every time we turn the camera on or off. We can clean now. On the crash course, I demonstrate how to clean the sensor manually using some very simple tools. The automatic sensor is great, but sometimes it doesn't work. It requires a little bit more, but here's the clean manually. What this does is it flips the mirror up, gives us access to the sensor. Pretty straightforward, but I know it's nerve wracking if you've never done it before. 
Viewfinder display is the optical viewfinder. We have some options here that we can choose, including an electronic level, a grid display, if we wanted to see it, and the flicker detection. So just preference, usually turn all these off. Info button display options. So when we press our information button, what do we want to, to see on the back monitor? Do you want to see the electronic level and the quick control screen? If you didn't want to, you would uncheck each of those boxes. I'll leave it on for now. We can switch the function of these far to right buttons. Over here, the cluster selection button in the auto exposure lock button, which is also the magnify and unmagnify button. So if we come in here and enable it, it flips those two. We have the ability to determine our HDMI resolution, whether it's auto or forcing it at 1080p. The multifunction lock is this button right here when we are in a shooting mode. So not during a playback mode, but when we're shooting, if we press the garbage can icon, it's going to say your controls are locked. It's lock indication. And it, the question is, well, what controls are locked exactly? Well, it's in this menu. Come back in. We look at it. It will lock the secondary control wheel, the touch screen, or the primary selector. If these are selected, you have to select them. And so that's how the lock screen works. It depends on what you have selected. We'll hit OK. Everything's turned off. Now my lock isn't locking anything at all. Coming in to page five on the yellow tab, custom functions. There's a lot of them in here. Most of them, the vast majority, I'm going to say, leave them exactly where they are. and Don't change anything. A lot of it is preference like, do you want your exposure controls to shift between a third stop and a half stop? Well, I kind of like a third stop, and I think it's good for beginners. The ISO expansion, if you want to shoot at higher ISOs, you could. But what I'm going to do is come in here and talk about ITR, because this one is important. ITR, intelligent tracking features, what Canon has done is they've put face detection in the optical focusing squares. The idea is fantastic but it isn't implemented very well. And we had some huge problems with it on the Canon 90D when I went out in a sport shooting and the camera was, was having a really hard time focusing on the things I wanted it to. So I'd put focusing squares you know, on my, on my friend's son and it would focus on the background. And so what happens with this algorithm is it's trying to track a moving subject that it thinks is a face. And if that face pattern is, de is detected in some bushes behind the athlete, it's gonna focus on the bushes. So for this reason, I recommend not using ITR e either on the T8i or the Canon 90D because it creates so many focusing problems. If you disable this, ITR is turned off completely and, and a lot of Canon 90D users, once they've done this, the focusing systems went, went back to what they're used to. If you enable it, the metering and the focusing and the tracking will follow colors and shapes. And so in some instances, it depends on the sport and what you're doing, you can have it on enable and that will not lock on to facial patterns. But if that's too complicated, just go with the disabled for now. A lot of these other features are, you know, things I would say, I recommend just leave them on, you know, illumination in the viewfinder auto is great. Mirror lockup is another one. If you want to shoot with mirror lockup, you would have to come into feature 10. It basically flips the mirror up so you don't have vibrations. There's two button presses. There's one to flip the mirror up and there's the other one to actually take the picture. So probably a little bit more advanced than for pure beginners. We have different you know, warnings in the viewfinder, displays, custom buttons, retracting lens, certain lenses. The most important thing in here is the ITR stuff. We can clear the settings that we've changed. We have our copyright information. If we wanted to write our name or our company into the EXIF data of our images, we would come in here and write your name, the year, copyright, things of that nature. If you wanted to get the manual, the manual that came with the camera was pretty thin, but I'm hoping that this video will answer most of your questions. But if you wanted to download the manual, it's like 
three or 400 pages long. This is where you can find it. We have some certification logos for electronics. This page doesn't do anything. It just basically says this camera has been certified to be electronically safe. And then we have the firmware. And almost always with just about every camera I can think of, you know, a few months after its release, the camera company will come out and say, hey, we got some new firmware. Firmware is the software of the camera and allows us to upgrade certain features, to fix certain bugs. Same with the lens. We can see which lens firmware we have. And pretty straightforward process. You download it to a memory card, put the memory card into the camera, and it would recognize it when you come in here and hit OK. So this is where we update the firmware. This Aqua tab, we've already talked about it. It's, it's basically to get certain prompts in displays and guides. I've turned off almost all of them just because I like the dark screen. I have more features, more options. And then we come to the My Menu tab. We've talked about three or four different dozen features, and there's going to be some of them you're going to use more than others. And when that's the case, you can put your most commonly used features on this green tab so you don't have to go diving in the deep menu all the time. So if I wanted to add to My Menu tab, I'd come in here. It's going to create a new page. And then we select items to register. Image quality, something I use quite a bit. Another one that I use a lot is the format. So, and these are all in, in the same order as that we find in the, as we go through the menu format. So those two items are the ones that I use the most. I'm going to hit, come back out to the menu. I can sort the order if I wanted to by selecting it and pushing up or down. I can delete selected items. I can delete all of them from a tab delete a tab i can rename a tab so this is kind of cool we can name your tab hit okay so once we are all set up now we've created a custom page within the green tab for the items that we use the most and that is the my menu it's super useful super handy all this said there is a different set of menu features when we go into the video mode. So I'm going to push this switch forward, come in. So we've got our video screen. It's basically the camera saying you're in video mode now. Press the menu button. And you can see that image quality is grayed out because we're in video mode, right? Coming over to this red tab, in the very start, you can see that we have a number of features that have changed. Instead of quality, we get the movie recording size, including 4K, at 24 frames per second, we get standard HD at 60 frames per second, standard HD at 30 frames per second, different compression, smaller file size, IPB, IPB. They're calling it light IPB. And we have standard IPB and 720. So if you want to shoot 4K, this is the option we're, we're choosing. If you're shooting standard HD for, for YouTube, I'm typically shooting at 30 frames per second. Some of the other features that we get in the video is the digital zoom, which is basically zooming in on the image. It's not an optical zoom. We have our movie self timer to start and stop video recording. We've talked about the manual levels and controlling the gain. We don't want to clip out, so we would turn this down if it was getting red. Movie digital image stabilization. I know a lot of people who actually like this. I personally don't. It basically gives the camera instructions to crop and stabilize the video electronically. If this is turned on, just know you'll lose some image quality when you do this. And then the rest of the stuff, when we come into these other tabs, is very similar to the things we've already covered. We have our movie servo autofocus. So if you see the eye detection, you're trying to enable it and it's grayed out, just make sure that you're on face detection here. Tab two is a little bit different. We have our time-lapse movie mode. I talk about that in the crash courses. I give a demonstration about how to use these for sunset shooting, for example. We have the ability to have remote control and then a video snapshot. It's another thing I never use. So I know that's a lot of information. If you come in through these other tabs, most of them are identical to the other ones we've already covered. 
And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the deep menu system on the Canon T8i. Let's talk about using Wi-Fi to connect wirelessly. Let's talk about connecting our Canon T8i to Canon's Camera Connect app. In order for this to work, we will have to download the app from either the Apple App Store or Google Play Store. And this is what it looks like. There are different ways to connect, but I'm going to teach you the most important one because it's pretty much fail safe. So we're going to come in to our deep menu. We're going to go to the purple tab and we're going to select Wi-Fi Bluetooth connection. I'm going to pick smartphone. In this case, I'm using an iPhone X, iPhone 10, whatever you want to call it. We're going to go to the device we want to connect to. The idea of this screen is that it will display the QR code if you need to download the app. We're going to hit do not display. And it gives us some option to pair either by Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. Bluetooth connectivity, it doesn't allow you to do the things that the Wi-Fi connectivity does. And sometimes there are some problems with this. For the sake of simplicity, I'm going to connect via Wi-Fi. Hit OK. And what this does is it puts the T8i into Wi-Fi mode. It's broadcasting a Wi-Fi signal. It's telling us the name of the camera. So what I need to do is to go into my smartphone Wi-Fi settings. Currently, I'm connected to my home network, MM. And I'm going to turn that off and reset it so it'll pull up the list of available Wi-Fi connections. And we should see the T8i. It's right here. And then it's asking for a password. And that password is given right here. So I'll share it with you guys. Just don't hack into my T8i. 69. And at this point, the phone is connecting to the T8i's Wi-Fi connection. So when this, they're communicating and they're thinking about it. So at this point, what we need to do is come back to the Canon Connect app. So, and then it says, we found a new camera. I'm gonna select the T8i. So this is easy to miss, is that when you get these screens, it wants us to hit okay. It's basically giving the camera permission to connect to it. And at this point, we get these menu items that we can now view. Once we are connected, this is the image that you'll see. We'll have these options in terms of selecting the images on the camera, remote live view shooting, auto transfer. We can embed GPS data in the camera settings. The most useful, in my opinion, is the remote live view shooting. It works for about 20 to 25 feet through the Wi-Fi signal of the app. And the first time you open this, you may see something inverted. And something that the T8i is, is trying to do is to make it easier to record videos to post on our social media in the portrait or the tall orientation. So if you see this problem, you're going to come in to this little camera gear wheel icon and it says live view rotation, which means we can rotate it. Now it's vertically tall, rotate it again, and that should get us squared away. Some great features in here is we have the ability to autofocus. We're engaging the camera's autofocus. It's using the full screen, almost the full screen, looking for an area of contrast. We push the shutter button to take a picture. We can come down to our aperture setting. I'm in aperture priority mode, and I can change my aperture. If I wanted to change my exposure compensation to make it brighter or darker, I can also change my ISO. If we wanted to shoot in manual mode, I'd flip it over on the camera. Now I'm in manual mode, and I can change my shutter speed here as well. It's very nice. Shutter speed aperture ISO. We also have the ability to choose the drive mode, whether it's a timer, multiple shots. We can do fine focus. We want to focus forward and backward. We can choose our focusing clusters. And then using the smartphone, touching on the screen itself to determine where we will focus. It's, it's not as sensitive as the back of the camera. You've got to kind of really hit it. We have some other settings in this gear icon. If we go down a little bit, mirror live view display, live view magnification, touch autofocus, we can determine whether these are active or not. It's fun to come in here and, and take a look around. You can see the number of shots remaining is not limited to 9,999 as it is on the camera. When we come into the video record mode, we get our audio levels. We can start and stop video recording. Very nice. 
And some people are very frustrated with the Canon app. I would say Canon's is one of the better ones out there, even with the glitches and the bugs and things of that nature. We have our white balance. If you want to change your white balance, resolution. We have our microphone settings, including the gain, wind filter and attenuator, all available in the app. So Canon has clearly been working on this since the last time I've seen it. These other options weren't in there. Let's take a look at some of these settings. So you know, the autofocus button, live view. So coming back to regular shooting, coming back out into the main menu, and it gives us this warning of if we switch to another app while we're connected to the Wi-Fi, the connection might be interrupted, okay? Another very useful feature is to look at the images that we've taken on the camera. Uh, I have mixed feelings about this, but it's kind of nice if you're out in the field and you have a picture you want to post to social media right away. We can choose different displays in terms of the view. Come back out, gives us the warning again. The location information essentially allows us to pair our GPS data from our smartphone into the images of the EXIF data of the files. So if we wanted to begin logging, we would turn this on. Pretty fun thing. Just know that it will drain your battery as you're continually logging and updating the GPS coordinates to your files. So I leave it turned off. I turn this guy off too. And then we have some basic camera settings, including the date, time, time zone, thing of that nature. For me, this has been the most reliable fail safe method. You can also connect by Bluetooth, but you'll notice there are some connection issues and sometimes it'll drop. Maybe you don't get all the features. And this is why I stick with teaching the Wi Fi. I use this app often for remote shooting, I use it all the time. So it's something you should definitely be aware of and have in your tool bag. Let me make some lens and gear accessory recommendations. Talking about lenses, we have the ability to put on different lenses with different focal lengths. And this is really dependent on the subject that we're shooting. There are some important considerations to keep in mind, the first of which is that this is an APS-C camera. APS-C size sensors mean that the sensor is smaller than a 35 millimeter frame of film. And because of this, when we put a lens onto an APS-C sized sensor, there is a multiplication factor on the focal length of the lens. And in the case of the T8i, it is 1.6x. What does that mean? Basically means if you take a 50 millimeter lens and put it on our camera, we're gonna multiply 50 times 1.6, and we get an equivalent focal length of 80 millimeters. So what that means is, is that the field of view is 80. So the lenses are rated, their measurements are given in their true focal length, but there's this multiplication factor we always have to keep in mind. If it was a 100 millimeter lens, it would be a 160 millimeter equivalent. So that's the first consideration, is you always need to be aware of that. The second consideration is that Canon makes EFS lenses, which are designed specifically for crop sensor cameras, and they also make full frame lenses. Full frame lenses, we know they're full frame because there's no white dot on them. And it's also given in the description when you're purchasing them. If you see the description EFS or you see the white dot on the lens, that lens was designed specifically for APS-C sized sensors. The important thing about this note is that you cannot use EFS lenses on full frame Canon camera bodies, but you can use Canon full frame lenses on crop bodies. And there's some full frame lenses that are actually really good on crop bodies. I'll be recommending one in just a second. So keep that in mind that if you think you're going to upgrade to a full frame camera at some point, your EFS lenses, you're probably going to need to sell them. On the other hand, if you purchase a full frame lens, you should be able to use it on both the full frame and our camera, the T8i. So when we get into the specifics of the lenses, there are two really good kit lenses. One is the 18 to 55. It's been updated many times. The latest version is obviously going to be the best. And there's also the 18 to 135. It's a general purpose, a little bit more telephoto, really good lenses both if you are just getting started if you want something with a wider aperture there's the 17 to 55 2.8 it's more expensive but it's a higher quality lens in my opinion 
and its performance overall in, in all aspects are, are better than the kit lenses. If you're any kind of sports shooter, the two lenses you should consider are the 55 to 250 and the 70 to 300. Those are both great telephoto options that are a little bit more affordable. And if you are doing anything wide angle or video recording, vlogging, things of that nature, the lens I recommend there is the 10 to 18. It's a very small, compact, wide angle lens. I think that fits the bill the most on the T8i. There are some other lenses out there, but I like Canon's uh, color in the lenses more than third-party manufacturers. It just looks better in my opinion. Probably a must-have is Canon's 50 millimeter 1.8. This is a full-frame lens, but on the T8i, it's an awesome portrait lens. And we get that very wide aperture. It's like 120 bucks, tremendous value all day long. Even if that is too expensive, there's a company called Yunguno that makes a knockoff version of it Get this for $50. Now we'll put those links in the description. Now having said all this, you should also be aware that Canon makes some incredible high-end full-frame lenses. The holy trinity is the 24 to 70 2.8 version two. There's a 70 to 200 2.8 version two and three. They're very comparable, both very good. And there is also the 16 to 35. There's multiple versions of each of these models but that is the holy trinity when they're all at 2.8. This is what the pro wedding photographers are using. There's tons of options when we're talking about sports shooting, you know, more telephoto, but they are also much more expensive. At some point, you are definitely going to want to invest in a tripod. The tripods, the brand names, you're looking at the Be Free from Bogan Manfrotto. There's also the Mi Photo tripods. They can be a little bit more expensive. Something that I try to do is to save my students money. So if I have found a comparable tripod that will save you anywhere from $50 to $80, check the links below. Those are really high quality. The ones I don't recommend are the one, the flimsy ones from Walmart where you spend 50 or 60 bucks and they fall apart after you know, like two or three months. It's just a waste of money. Invest a little bit of money into a sturdy, strong tripod and you will thank yourself for it after many years. When we're getting into flash systems, the flash I recommend is the Godox TT685C. C stands for Canon. They also make an X-Pro transmitter that will allow us to move the flash off of the camera I cover the flash and the techniques on the crash course. It's just an added bonus lesson, it's just under an hour. And I will show you how the flash operates and how to take great images using the flash. At some point, many of you will be interested in video recording and the built-in microphone is not that great. It just doesn't sound well and we can hear the operations of the camera as we're handling it. So if you're just getting started into video and you need a good external microphone, the mic I recommend is the one that I have manufactured to my specs. It's called the Maven Mini Mic. It has a deeper frequency range than many of the competitors, including the Rode Video Mic. It has a lower frequency range, which is better for male voices. So some of these other ones, when, when they have higher frequencies, they sound a little bit tinny, like you're talking into a tin can. It's a very tough microphone. It's a great starter mic. And if you decide to get more serious and invest you know, hundreds of dollars into a microphone, it would be a tremendous backup. There is also an additional pro mount that has a shock absorber and two additional cold shoes. That's something that I 3D print up. I will put those links in the description as well. Ultimately, the best investment that you can make is right here. It's the knowledge in operating your camera. You've invested a lot of money into a great camera. Let me show you how to maximize its value. I say this because we are in production on the Canon Rebel T8i crash course that will teach you all of those things. It's the fastest, easiest way to learn your camera. If you're interested in it, I will put the link in the description. If we're still in production, leave your name and your email address on my blog and we will reach out to you as soon as it's ready. In any event, thank you guys so much for watching my tutorial. I hope to see you on the crash course.